Hi, I'm David Fernie. Today on Studio Space, we're visiting with Julian Lang, a multimedia artist and Kuruk tribal member. I'm looking forward to learning more about his culture and art. Hey, Julian. Thanks so much for joining us, Julian. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. You've spent many years, you know, working diligently to preserve your language and also teach it um, to other people and young people. Can you tell us a little bit about that work and what it means to you? That's what made me uh, pursue everything. You know, uh, once I uh, began to understand and, and acquire the language, it really provided the the fork in the road. Here I am going down a, a fork as an artist, as kind of an odd character outside the you know mainstream anyway. Then there's another fork, which was language, which was a whole way, new way of thinking. It's something that I think that uh, people hopefully will hear more and more about, the importance of that, the importance of the language. But I guess the most important uh, uh, audience is our young people and so they have taken to our language as you know i can wear feathers i can wear beads i can do this and that i can dance and i can do these are all important building blocks to who you are as an indigenous person it's a true fact that the western mind is so linear there's a only, only could be a beginning and an end and Whereas the indigenous way is that, no, this is all intertwined and like, this is the end of my garden here. You know, next year there'll be a new garden and it'll be different fruits and vegetables and we will eat and be happy in a different kind of way. Can you tell us a little bit about your painting work and what some of your influences are with that? You know, I'm a self-taught painter for the most part and I tried and I, hit and miss. So I started as a drafts, draftsman. So I drew and that's, uh, that's all I did was just draw, draw, draw. The result of that draftsmanship, I recall, I could even tell you, I was living in Santa Rosa and I was trying to paint and I was, you know, I had acrylics out and I was trying to do all of this, uh, you know, fancy things, and it just was one mushy drawing after the other, one mushy painting after the other, until finally, suddenly I was able to create all these fantastically, to me, fantastically beautiful things. And the color made sense, the, you know, the composition made sense, all, all the important elements made sense, and so I became a painter at that point. Is it a relaxing pastime for you, uh, um, doing your painting? You know what, uh, it is a zone. Uh -huh, it's a zone? It's a zone that you get into and it is uh, kind of all encompassing. This is my, our, our living room, but it's also my, unfortunately, my studio. And so once this is set up, it kind of is pretty much here. It's part of the furniture now. Uh -huh. And so it'll be here until I finally do what I plan to do and get done what I plan to get done. And then usually in the meantime, something else has popped up and now I've got to go for a different project. Because the thing about an artist is you're ne you never, you can never retire because it's a, uh, that continuum that we talked about earlier, that idea of leads into one thing, leads to the other. So this one here is, is a mural on the wall that I may add, begin adding a completely different, different elements. elements. Uh -huh. The language may come back. There is going to be, if you know it's on the wall, this like this area here is kind of a stylized river. Pai uh, Pasam or Sam Wanakti, whatever, which means Pai Pasam is the, this flow here came from up the river. Uh -huh. And so it's like, a, as, they, as the linguists say, a circumlocution. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that yeah I like, cool. I notice you use a lot of language in your yeah, paintings. Yeah, yeah. Which is I, cool. I, you know, to me, that's kind of, I guess that's what I'm most known for in my painting. Uh -huh. 
And uh, I didn't realize that, but early on, I'm kind of, that was an important part of everything that I did was language and including that and it, exposing that to people, these like long words, uh -huh. these odd consonants all thrown together. Uh -huh. What the heck could that possibly be? Has there been any, any interesting um, critiques over the years of your work? Any favorites, whether positive or negative? I think the most interesting uh, one came from, uh, and I can't remember who it was, but I can see their face and they were saying, what in the heck is going through his mind? If I was to say, how does my culture inform what I do? It's been pretty primary and fundamental to everything I do, no matter if it's a political situation that needs attention or if it's a, uh, some sort of uh, artistic creative project, it informs it. I've never felt like, oh, you've got to be an American successful this and that type person. And I've kind of almost rejected the American uh, dream as a quasi nightmare. So I'm more of a, uh, a, a dreamer, but from the standpoint of my culture. You recently did a wonderful big outdoor uh, mural project can you tell us a little bit about that project and uh, how different it was for you uh, painting-wise? Well, as you know, I do not do things like uh, in a vacuum or like in a disjointed way. Everything's connected with what I have been doing. We were planning to do a number of murals in the juvenile hall. We've actually executed several of them. And so I had three or four other ideas. So what I decided to do was to go through a box and find my uh, drawing, because I know I had seen it recently. So, so that's what you're seeing there is an adaptation of that, a real expansion of what we were going to do at the juvenile hall. But uh, it was very kind of very uh, satisfying because I was able to include a lot of young people, family, you know, our young, my grandkids and all of that. So a definite pleasure to see it happen. And it was interesting too because it was during COVID so normally I found out with hanging out a little bit that normally you would be heavily involved with uh, you know with the dances and cultural stuff during that time yeah. which wasn't happening right. during COVID so it was kind of a little interesting little replacement to mm -hmm. to connect with people. Yeah and that was the uh, the idea again that reconnecting so we're not going to have ceremonies because of COVID. So, uh, well, let's put the ceremony on the wall then yeah. and, and create uh, uh, the title of the piece is uh, Fixing the World the Old Fashioned Way. And it was an idea that the center, so in the center of that image is the center of the world, what we call the center of the world. The land, you know, the tree, the yellowness of some of the landscape is reflects you know our belief in heaven and there's a yellow hue to everything in heaven you know so there's like it's kind of like here earth you see in the circle you see the earth becoming itself uh, over the years you've you've gravitated to working with a lot of diverse partners and collaborations uh, and i wonder if there's any particular collaborations or partners uh, that were some of your favorites or, or more interesting projects? I read this book uh, by Twyla Tharp. It was called Collaboration or How to Collaborate. Very uh, interesting book because uh, it, I, I felt it. Collaborations are really great until you're right in the middle of it. And then you realize, <laughs> oh, half the job is just the human interaction and working through all of that. Uh, how do you work with the schedule when you're a you're a early riser and your collaborators, uh, you know, night owl doesn't get up till one, two, three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, and uh, so you've got to try to solve problems that you didn't know you were going to have to solve. The, your collaborator will bring a perspective or a voice that you cannot conceive of they somehow they provide you with a solution that you would never have thought of. I really glommed on early uh, to collaboration because I felt like no matter what we do as native 
artists, creatives. We have to collaborate with a society that, that doesn't understand us. And sometimes your collaborator will, will, will reveal the source of that, uh, of that misunderstanding. And yeah, they may not even know it, and vice versa. And that somehow my perspective is so out of line with what mainstream thinking is. You know, how, how do we, how do we, you know, how do we remold this so that it, it uh, makes sense? And then your language makes it all make sense. So you start acquiring the basic language, you know, and, and vocabulary. And the next thing you know, you're starting to, you know, have little snippets of cultural belief that is so different than anything you could have ever imagined. You are you're on your, you know, on your machine one day, uh, you know, killing whatever. <laughs> and then, you know, the next day you're like, this is like what life is all about. And so I think a lot of American kids are, are kind of shortchanged by not being exposed to what life really means, you know, that it's not a part of the entertainment industry, you know, in all its various forms, you know, or whereas indigenous people, indigenous kids, I think that's a very good strength, uh, a powerful medicine for them, that they're able to uh, understand the meaning of life in a way that is not Cartesian and laid out to you in a schematic kind of way, but that it's a, uh, it's like a song that, that you can sing that over time it will make more and more sense. That the, you start singing that song louder and louder as you, as you age. It will become an important part of their life. Well, thank you so much for sharing your creative spirit with us, Julian. Thank you. It's been really a pleasure.